All right, so each time after the lecture class and before the practice, I will put online a series of video questions that they are, and what I will do is work them out on the board here. This is a supplement to lecture. I will do some example problems, but not a large number of example problems in lectures, so I'm giving you a few example problems here. Since there's no reading assignments for this class, by and large, these are the uh, things that you'll be doing instead of the reading assignments. So each week, watch this before the practice section, and hopefully you'll be more prepared to start on the homework that you get in the practice section. So the first question this week, this week we're talking about quantities and dimensions, significant figures, units on numbers. You will discover during the term that I am very anal about there being units on numbers. Physical quantities have dimensionalities associated with them. A length is a length, a time is a time. If I write down a length, how many feet is it or how many meters? It makes a difference. You always have to have the units on the numbers. If you don't have units, it's not right. So here's your first question. You have a car and it gets a gas mileage of 29.7 miles per gallon. So I would write this down, 29.7 miles per gallon. Now already you should be suspicious, because probably from personal experience, if you have tracked the gas mileage in your car, it changes by one or two miles per gallon. And so the fact that I have reported the gas mileage to the first decimal place is probably more accurate than you really know the mileage of your car, but we're gonna go with it for this problem. All right, next, your gas tank holds 11.5 gallons. And the question is, how many kilometers can you drive before you run out of gas? I don't say this, but let's go ahead and assume we're starting with a full tank. Well, all right, I'm gonna answer a different question first, and that is how many miles can I run before I run out of gas? Well, every gallon of mile, every gallon of gas lets me go 29.7 miles. So 29.7 miles per gallon well, I've got 11.5 gallons, so I just multiply the number of gallons by the number of miles I get for each gallon, and I'll get the number of miles I can go. In fact, here, notice, I have gallons on the top and the bottom. It's just multiplication, so I can cancel that out. You notice I will just be left with miles, and I'm going to whip out my little calculator here, which is actually my phone, but that's how we roll nowadays, and I will multiply 29.7 by 11.5, and I will get 341 Point five five miles. Now, a couple things about this. If, if the question was how many miles can you go, the answer would be 342 miles. Why? Because there's three significant figures here, there's three significant figures here. The rule is when you multiply numbers, the number of significant figures of whichever is least precise, okay, well it's both three significant figures here so it's the same, is the number of significant figures you have in the answer. So it doesn't go to the tenths place, it would be 342, because 1.55 rounds up to two. However, this is not my final answer. I actually want kilometers. So what I'm going to do is, is convert this to kilometers because this is an intermediate number. I'm keeping extra digits. You should always keep extra digits for intermediate calculations. So I need to quickly look up. I don't have memorized the number of miles in a kilometer. It's 1609 maybe, but I'm gonna look it up. And there it is, um, I was close, one, well, for meters, actually, in a while. One mile is equal to 1.60934 kilometers. I just looked that up on Google, huh, whatever, hopefully it's right, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's correct. So I have this many miles, I need to know how many kilometers, this is the unit factor method. I can just start with 341.55 miles, always have units on your numbers, and I'm gonna multiply this number by one. You can always multiply a number by one and you don't change it. But I'm gonna write one in a clever way. I'm going to write it as 1.60934 kilometers. Notice I could have just said 1.6 kilometers. And you're pretty good, but that number would only have been good to two significant figures. Whenever you look up a number, keep the number you look up to more significant figures than you want in your final answer. Otherwise, you will lose precision in your final answer, and it won't be quite right. And so this is, in fact, I'm going to write this clearly like this. The thing in parentheses here is equal to 1, because 1 1.60934 kilometers is equal to 1 mile. When you divide something by something else that is equal to, that quotient is 1. So this, I'm multiplying by 1, 
So it won't change the answer, but it'll give me a different number with different units. So if I multiply this by 1.60934, I get 550. Well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write down a couple extra digits and then talk about rounding. So it's 549.67. It's 549.67 kilometers. Now, I know my final answer should have three significant figures because this number only has three significant figures. I've written down five digits because you keep extra digits for intermediate numbers, but only three of them are significant. This has more significant figures, so this is what limits it. So I only have three significant figures, so when I round this, it's actually 550 kilometers, which is awkward because you're not really sure if that number has two or three significant figures. There's two ways you can do this. If I put a period here, I am saying this zero is significant. The safest way to do it is to write it like this, 5.5 .5 times 10, so I'm doing it wrong, 5.50 times 10 to the two kilometers, which is a little less, doesn't communicate quite as well because you have to unpack the scientific notation, but it's sort of a more precise way of being really clear. I have three significant figures here. So the answer to the question as asked is this, and that's how you get to it. That is the first question. Second problem. A recipe calls for 200 milliliters of milk. You need 200 milliliters of milk. milk. Unfortunately, you don't have any metric measuring cups. You have measuring cups labeled one cup. I'm going to draw little pictures here because it'll be cute. All right? So there's one that's, that's one cup. You have one labeled half a cup. I really want to make it look smaller. You have one labeled a third of a cup. And one labeled a quarter cup. All right? Those are the measuring cups you have. How do you get the right amount of milk? And the answer is, I am lactose intolerant. Zero is the right amount of milk. That is not the answer. The right answer is that you are making this for somebody else who is not lactose intolerant because you are a kind and giving person who makes cookies for people. So you need to figure out, how do I get 200 milliliters from this many cups? And you notice I didn't write units on these numbers, so I'm a bad person. Um, but whatever, they look like cups, right? We know they're cups. Good. Well, here's the first number you need, and I actually already looked it up. So one cup is equal to 236.588 milliliters. That is to plenty of digits. You notice here, in fact, it's not even really clear how many significant figures this number is to. It could be as few as one, because you're never sure with the zeros. It could be as many as three. Hmm. We don't know. So I'll be safe and assume it's three, and then we'll talk about that a little later on. Because sometimes you have to use common sense. Now, common sense is one of those things that requires a grounding. So if you don't have any experience with something, common sense doesn't mean anything. It's like when I was first learning how to cook stuff back when I was a kid, and my mom says, put, you know, put about what just seems like the right amount of basil into your spaghetti sauce. I, says, I have no basis. What's the right amount? Whatever. I can do it now, but I couldn't then. Well, okay, so how can I get the right amount of milk? Well, my goodness, one cup is too much. I already know that this is gonna to be too much, so I know I don't wanna fill this guy up. I'm just gonna not even use that one. So then the next question is, what is half a cup? Well, let's suppose I fill up a half cup with milk. So what I'm going to do is figure out a half of a cup, and I'm going to use the unit factor method. If I multiply it by 236.588 milliliters divided by one cup, all right, and I can figure out that this, so I put in 0.5 for one half, multiply it, the cups cancel, multiply it by 236.588 times, and I get 118.294 cups. That's what this will give me this many milliliters. Well, that's awkward. Let's just figure out one third of a cup. I can convert this the same way, 236.588 milliliters divided by one cup. My C's look terrible. Cancel out the cups. Again, I have 236.588 on the top. I divide by three and I get, that can't be right. 
So here's what I got. I got 710, and I know that it's got to be less than this number. So I know I did, made a calculation error. So I'm going to do it again. 236.5. You should think about the numbers you get, and if they don't make sense, redo them. 3 divided by this does make sense. I get 78.863 cups. Okay, that seems reasonable. And then here, one quarter of a cup, and I do the same conversion, 236.588 milliliters divided by one cup. You thought you were taking physics, not cooking, huh? 236, because cooking is chemistry. 236.588 divided by four, I get 59.147. That's half of that. 59.147. All right, well, what do I do about this? Well, all right. At this point, there's not just a quick, okay, follow exactly this procedure. So I'm going to start playing around with it and see what I can get. 200 milliliters, let's suppose I start with a half cup. If I have 200 milliliters and I use, a, I, I start with a half cup, how much do I have left still to do? I'm going to subtract minus 118.294 milliliters. I wrote all of these things wrong over here. I apologize. You were probably wondering as you were doing this, what is he doing? He's doing it wrong. All of these things here should have been milliliters because that's what was left from the calculations. Sorry, but it's fixed now. Okay, so 200 milliliters minus 118294 milliliters. Well, that's the same as 200 milliliters minus half a cup. Um, I suppose I should be able to do this in my head. I'm going to get something like 72, but let's just do it on the calculator because, you know, we're modern Americans and we're lazy and don't do math in our heads anymore. It's very sad. I weep openly. And I get 81. Did I say 72? I lied. I meant 82. 81.706 milliliters left to do. And now what I'm going to say is, hey, look, 81 is pretty close to 78. That in fact, this is so close to that, that if I took the half cup and I filled it up with milk, and so here, I'm going to fill it up with milk. And you're saying, that's not milk, that's blood. And I'll say, eh, whatever. You know, sometimes you substitute an ingredient. It'll still taste good. Um, I fill up my half cup with milk, 118.294 milliliters. And if I add the third cup to it, 78.862 milliliters, I'm going to get, I'm going to do this on my calculator, even though, again, I probably should be able to do the addition by hand here. But you know, laziness is a noble thing. I get 197.156 milliliters. Now, here's what I'm going to do at this point. Notice that to two significant figures, this number is the same as that number. Both of them are 200 to two significant figures. Because here, I would round the 7 up to the next, so this becomes 200. And really, when you're cooking with recipes, how precise does it have to be? If you think about it, if I demand that this be good to three significant figures, that means I want my measurement of my milk to be good to 1%. And when we're cooking, you know, recipes aren't really that accurate. When I make spaghetti sauce nowadays, I don't measure the basil. I kind of say, psh, psh, well, that's about the right amount. You're not good to 1% when you're doing that. So if we think about our context here for recipes, two significant figures is probably about right. Then you're good to something like 10%. Maybe that's a little too loosey-goosey, but we're in the right general area. So here, I'm only off by 3 out of 200. That's not very much in the context of thinking about recipes. There are some physical calculations we will eventually do where 1% is, you want to be more precise than that. But in this context, this is so close, the answer is, if I fill up a one-half cup and a one-third cup together, that'll give me 200 milliliters of whichever liquid, milk or blood, depending on whether you're a crazy sociopathic vampire person or somebody just making cookies, you will have the right amount of liquid with the half cup and the third cup. That's the second problem. The key things here to recognize are, I didn't just have a procedure I could follow, I stopped and I played around with the numbers and I thought about it and when I was done I could make the argument, hey, this plus this equals that. I had to think about precision. I'm not exactly the same, but it's not wrong. This is close enough, which sometimes is right. And then third, of course, the standard unit conversion and then writing down the right thing over here, which I didn't do. Problem number two. The acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth usually represented by the variable g, is 9.8 meters per second squared. 
we will be using this a fair amount in just a week or two. Great, okay, that is what G is, the acceleration due to gravity. I should just put in as a side, some of you will think, shouldn't G be minus 9.8 meters per square second squared? The answer is no, it should not, for reasons that I will discuss in class when we get to it. First question, what is G in feet per second squared? So our goal is to get G in feet per second squared. We're actually not too far off. We have 9.8 times, sorry, times 10 to the zero, which is one, so I'm not even gonna write that down. 9.8 meters per second squared. And I need to multiply it by something that has feet on the top and meters on the bottom. What is that something? Well, I could go look up number of meters in a foot or number of feet in a meter. But it turns out I actually have a number memorized I could calculate this from. Here's the thing I know. I don't know why I know this, but I do know this, that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters, right? Well, that's pretty exciting. So what I have is one inch divided by 2.54 centimeters is equal to one. And remember, the goal is I'm multiplying this number by one so I don't change it. So this thing in parentheses has to be equal to one. I also know one inch, well, there is one foot in 12 inches. I know that one. And I also know centimeter, there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And notice if I multiply these three ones together, I still get one. Centimeters will cancel because it's top and bottom. Feet doesn't. I shouldn't have crossed that out. That was a mistake. Feet stays. Inches cancel because it's top and bottom. I will be left with feet per meter. So I can actually work out this number I need without looking it up. You're thinking, this is way more work, but whatever. If you don't have the table in front of you, you can just calculate it. So I take 100, I divide by 12, rink, and I divide by 2.54, and I get 3.2808. And that sounds about right, 3.2808 feet per meter. Right? We know a yard is three feet, and a meter is a little bit longer than a yard, so that looks about right. So three point, and notice I only have two digits here, so I'm just going to keep a couple of extra here. I'm going to write 3.281 feet per meter. My answer will still have be good to two digits. I have plenty of extra digits. Two is plenty. In my other number, and so now I multiply this, although what I'm really doing is just keeping the number of my calculator and multiplying it by 9.8. And I get 32.152 feet per second squared, but I'm not done yet. There's only two significant figures here, so I should only keep two significant figures here, so I get 32 feet per second squared. That's what G is in American units. I know they're British units, but in Britain they're enlightened and use metric, so really it's us holdout Americans who still use these crazy old feet things. Anyways, that's what it is. Now, the next question is very similar. So what I'm going to do, we've got this, yay. Remember, I erase it all. The next thing we want is in astronomical units per square year. Huh, you say? Well, all right. Why would you want such a thing? Well, okay, one of the things that I've been doing in the last few months is uh, running simulations of the solar system on the computer where I have all the planets orbiting around the sun using software that was designed really for this kind of thing. The natural units it uses are astronomical units. The astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And then a year is the natural time unit. The year is how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun. So these are units sort of tuned to solar system kinds of things. So if you're working with solar system things, that's actually sort of the natural acceleration unit to use. So let's suppose, now of course it's stupid to do this because if the, being at the surface of the Earth is irrelevant to tooling around in the solar system. Where might this matter is that if you're going to, I'm going to jump way ahead of humanity here, design spacecraft that fly through the solar system, how much can they accelerate so that the pilots don't get too many Gs, so that the pilots, you know, if they, if they accelerate at one G, or you're working out your celestial mechanics of orbiting around the sun, how much do they have to be accelerating if they go close to the sun, say, so that they don't feel like too many Gs? So that's maybe where you'd use it. But whatever, mainly I'm doing this as an exercise of dealing with unit conversions. Now, I am just going to tell you, actually, we're going to take a little cut here, right? My goal is to figure out how many astronomical units are there in a meter, or really how many meters are there in an astronomical unit is going to be the better way to say it. I'm on the course homepage here. 
I have useful links and references. That's just lower on the page. And at the bottom of this, you will see this. The particle data group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has some very handy reference tables of physical constants. That's how you have to read uh, web pages in that voice. And if you don't do that, you're doing it wrong. Okay, physical constant, astrophysical constants, SI units and prefixes. Well, we're looking for the astronomical unit. And hey, astrophysical constants, that's suggestive. Let's click on that. Here we are, astrophysical constants and parameters. Oh, there's a lot of stuff here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit, make it a little easier to read. And if we scroll down, and oh, look, look, astronomical unit. That's what we want, AU, although I usually write it capital AU. Scroll over, and it is, here's its value, AU. 1 AU is equal to 149597870700 meters. Ugh. I'd rather have that in scientific notation. So let's figure out how many times I have to move the decimal point over. So it starts here. I move it over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 1.49598 times 10 to the 11th meters is one astronomical unit. There, I've looked it up. Now I can use that number. Okay, so the result of all that is that it's 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters is equal to 1 AU. How many seconds in a year? Well, I could just look that up too, but it turns out I could work that one out just like I worked out the feet and meters. If I start with one year, all right, and here, now this is not one, this is one year, they're very different. I know there are 365.25 days in a year. Ah, 365 would have been close enough, and it's actually 0.24 or 0.26, I forget which. This is pretty close, the 0.25 because of leap years. All right, and so now the years cancel the years. I know there are 24 hours in a day, right, cancel. I know there are 60 minutes in an hour, cancel the hours, and I know there are 60 seconds in a minute. And when all is said and done, I can just multiply all these numbers together, so I'm gonna do that. So 365.25, this number doesn't have two significant figures. This number has an infinite number of significant figures. 24 hours in a day is perfect, right? We know that perfectly. This is not one of those uncertain physical quantities. We know that. That's the definition. Just like 60 minutes in an hour is the definition. So this will never limit my number of significant figures. This is not perfect. This is what limits my significant figures. And I'm actually only confident about this to the fourth digit. I think my fifth digit may be off here. So my, answer, my number of seconds in a year is going to be good to four significant figures because this has four, these are perfect numbers. So I take that, I multiply by 24, I multiply by 60, and I multiply by 60 again, and when all is said and done, I get 3.156. So good to four significant figures, 3.156 times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times 10 to the seven seconds. Pretty close, not exactly, to um, two or three significant figures, the same as pi times 10 to the seven seconds. So if I start with 9.8 meters per second squared, and now what I want to do is I want to have meters on the bottom and AU on the top. So 1 AU is equal to 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters, right? I can figure out whether to multiply or divide by just making it so that the units cancel out right. And now I want to have seconds on the bottom and years on the top, so I have one year divided by 3.156 times 10 to the 7 seconds, but notice I have, I did that wrong. Let's try that again. 3.156 times 10 to the 7 seconds divided by one year. So seconds could cancel seconds, but I have seconds squared here. And I need seconds squared here, so the easiest way to do that is to square this whole thing. Because if I square this whole thing, I square everything inside it. So this will be second squared, so now that can cancel the second squared, because it's inside of squared. But I have to remember to square the number, too. So let's do that. I'm going to take this number, um, I'm going to square it, if I can remember where the button for that is, there it is, boop. And I'm going to multiply it by 9.8 times, and I'm going to divide by 1.496 times 10 to the 11th. And I am going to get a big number. It's good to two significant figures there, but I'm going to write it to extras to start with. 6.524, 524 times 10 to the fourth AU per year. So I could say that G, now of course I only have two sig figs, so I'll write it like this. 6.5 times 10 to the fourth 
astronomical units per year squared. I wrote that down there, astronomical units per year squared. That is what little g is. All right, you will almost certainly never use this number in your life, except for this one problem, which we did as an example of unit conversion for practice. That was the third problem. All right, the last problem is the hardest one. It is the one that's sort of like the challenge problem on the homework. And what it says, the kinetic energy of an object, now you're thinking, I already know this, I've done this before, pretend you don't know. The kinetic energy of an object is the amount of energy it has as a result of its motion. We will discuss this at length later in the class. For now, let's just think about its units. Energy comes in units of joules, where one joule is equal to, and I'm gonna write it as it shows up here, which I did on purpose, one kilogram meters squared seconds to the minus two. And just to remind you, when you see something to a negative power, that means it is to the positive power in the denominator. So that's what that means. One joule is equal to that. All right, now, suppose you have a sphere. Now, this is how you know you're doing physics, because um, uh, we uh, every, make everything a sphere because it's the simplest object that you can have. We like to break things down to their basics and think about their simplest stuff. You have a sphere, its mass is m, it is moving at speed v, and its radius is r. All right, and so now I want to say, what's its kinetic energy? Those are the things that it potentially could depend on, right? How big it is, how heavy it is, how fast it's moving. Maybe you could think of other things, but those are the things I can think of that the kinetic energy might depend on. So let's guess, this is what I tell you to do here, let's guess that the kinetic energy of an object is going to be proportional to a product of these quantities with each quantity possibly raised to a different power. What does that even mean? Well, here's what that means, is that the kinetic energy is going to be proportional to, and there's two ways to write this, and I'm going to write it both ways. One is to use this as the proportionality sign. So this means is proportional to, and I'll show you the other way in a moment, a product of these three quantities, so it's R times V times M, that's the product, each possibly raised to a different power. So it could be R to the A times V to the B times M to the C. Where the heck did A, B, and C come from? I just made them up. Because A, they're not the same, but this is R raised to some power, V raised to another power, M raised to another power. The question is, how does the kinetic energy depend on the mass, radius, and speed of the sphere? Well, what that means is if I can figure out what A, B, and C are, like suppose A comes out to be one-third, then I'll say kinetic energy goes as the cube root of the radius. That's what, that, that's what this question is asking. Now, the other way I could write this is that kinetic energy is equal to some dimensionless constant, meaning this doesn't have any units on it. I'm going to go ahead and say I know that it's one half. What I'm doing right now, there's no way of figuring that out. So this dimensionless constant, we're not going to be able to figure out. So, okay, we're stuck. Times r to some power, times v to some power, times m to some power, the three some powers are all different. Now, how do I even figure out what a, b, and c are? Well, for that, what I'm going to do is take this out, because the dimensionless constant, we can't do anything about. Let's just not worry about it. The units have to work. So on the left, we have to get kilogram meters squared times seconds to the minus two. The units on the left have to equal the units on the right. Well, R comes in units of meters. Now, this is confusing, because here M is the mass, and here M means meters. This is just an unfortunate truth, that we are often going to use the variable M for mass, and the letter M is the unit meters. <laughs> so be a little careful about context here. So it's M to the A times meters per second, that's what speed comes in, to the B times mass comes in kilograms to the C. Well, okay. So now what I'm going to do is notice I have M to the A times M to the B. And if you remember how powers work, I get kilogram meters squared seconds to the minus two. I have M to the A times M to the B. That means it's meters to the A plus B. If you have one number to one power times another number to another power, or sorry, one number to one power times the same number to another power, it's that number to the sum of the powers, okay? As an example, two squared times two cubed. Well, if I write this out, two squared is two times two, and two cubed is two times two times two. That's two to the fifth. 
which is 2 to the 2 plus 3. This is just one specific example of this. Right? When I multiply these things to the powers, I sum the powers. So that's what I've done here, m to the a plus b. I have s seconds to the negative b, right? Because it's in the denominator to the b, so that's the same as being to the negative b, and I have kilograms to the c. And now if I look at this, notice I have kilograms over here by itself, and kilograms over here by itself, just from looking at that, I can conclude that C has to be equal to 1. That was really exciting. Good. Done. Next, if I look at meters and meters, I can conclude that A plus B has to equal 2. Well, that's not enough to figure out A and B by themselves, but okay, it's a constraint. And finally, seconds to the minus 2 seconds to the minus b, I can conclude that negative 2 is equal to negative b, or b equals 2, and now that I know that b is equal to 2, I know that a plus 2 is equal to 2, or a is equal to 0. So when all is said and done, I can figure out that kinetic energy has to be proportional to, well, r to the a, a is 0. Anything to the zero is one, so I'm not even going to write an r in there, times v, I want to make my proportional sign not so spastic, times v squared times m. This is the answer. Now you may remember, and we will see when we start talking about energy in this class, that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. All right. There's no way with dimensional analysis to get this one half. You have to know other things to get that. But we could figure out that kinetic energy, that the v squared and the m, it's the only way that makes the units work if R, V, and M are the only things that could affect it. Now, if you can think of other things that could affect it, you could get to the point where you're not really sure what works. But if these are the only things that could contribute to the kinetic energy, you can figure out it has to be mv squared. Some, some dimensionless constant, one half has no dimensions, times mv squared. So that's the end of the questions for this week. Um, yay, we're done.